We're in Genesis chapter 6 this evening. You guys missed that second ago here. Sorry about that. Figured it might be a kink or two tonight, but we got all the kinks worked out, so from here on out, we should be good. All right, so we're continuing on in this new study called The Big Picture, and the goal of this series is to continue to show everybody a little bit of an overview, especially of the Old Testament, uh, trying to give everybody a bit of a framework on uh, the Old Testament and seeing where the various stories uh, kind of fit in and all that. So do you guys remember kind of where we've been? where we were last week. Anybody who know where we left off? Start off with a question for a recap instead of just giving it to you. You weren't here. You, you guys were here. You were, you were supposed to go to Elysburg to have a... <laughs> no, let, well, well, last time we were in this room. Last week, okay. Yeah, not literally last week. The last, mm -hmm. last issue. I'll give you a hint. It's between Genesis 1 and Genesis 5. Oh. There we go. There we go. The fall, right? So we've opened with uh, two, two things so far, right? The, the idea that the initial creation um, was very good, right? God looked at everything he made. It was good. It was very good. And then we saw the origin of sin uh, last time in Genesis 3 with the fall. And if you remember, it didn't just go with one act of disobedience. It immediately progressed into things getting much worse, right? In Genesis 3, it was eating of a tree you're not supposed to eat of. And we might think, oh, that seems kind of a ridiculous thing. Well, the definition of sin is disobeying God. So no matter what God says is forbidden, doesn't matter what it is. If he says it's forbidden, you disobey, it's an act of sin. But it quickly went from eating the wrong fruit to now we saw that the first human being that was ever born becomes a murderer in Genesis 4. And then by Genesis 6, if you read the beginning of Genesis 6, it gets real ugly really fast. Right, the idea that every intention of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. And so we left off with things being very bad, um, all of creation having been corrupted by the fall and by sin and all these things. But then we saw one little bit of hope if somebody wants to begin by reading Genesis chapter 6, verse 8. No found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So that's where we left off. In the midst of everything being out of control, in the midst of sin on the rise, in the midst of every thought being only evil continually, there's a little measure of hope because there's this guy we're introduced to named Noah, and Noah found favor or grace in the eyes of the Lord. And so we're going to go over the story of Noah today, and let me assure you, it's so much more than just the Sunday school uh, cute little animals hopping on the boat. There's a lot of good stuff in here for us. So if somebody wants to begin, we're going to read verses 9 through 14 of Genesis 6 to set the stage this evening. These are the generations of Noah. Noah which is a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God, and Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw that the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For the flesh has corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh. For the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. You said through 14? Yeah, 14, and then that'll be it. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover inside and out with pitch. All right, so we're introduced to Noah again, right? Initially, we find out he's this guy who finds favor in God's sight, and now we know a little bit more about him. He's considered a righteous man. He walks with God, which is reminiscent of Enoch, who was the one guy uh, in this portion of the Old Testament who did not die. God took him up to heaven uh, without dying. And so there's kind of this reminiscing that he walks with God. And so God, in this time, there's, we're introduced to Noah, and then God looks down at the earth. And if you remember, in, in Genesis chapter 1, God looked at the earth, and he looked at everything he made, and he said, it's very good. But then now we see in Genesis chapter 6, he looks at the earth, and he notices two things. He looks at the earth, and he no longer sees a creation that is very good. He sees an earth that is filled with violence, one that is corrupt. Originally, it was good. Sin has come into the world and brought ruin. 
So then in verse 13, just as God spoke in the beginning, now God speaks and he promises destruction. Says to Noah, look, I'm going to make an end of all the, the living flesh on the earth. But in this, there's also a means of salvation. And so this is incredible. He speaks to Noah and he begins with Noah and he says, look, I need you to build an ark. So God sees, God speaks, and then God commands. God sees that everything is wicked. God speaks, tells Noah, I'm going to wipe everything out. And then he commands Noah, I need you to build an ark. And is there anybody here this evening that's ever wondered why the word ark is the word that's chosen? You ever wondered, like, why do they call it an ark and not just a boat or anything? Anybody? Or is everybody just normally like, oh, yeah, arcs all the time. You know, we, we're going to do a river float on the ark on Sunday. <laughs> you know, it's a flotation device of choice. Well, it's pretty interesting. I did a little study on this, on, and I want to share this with you. Uh, the word ark in English comes from a Latin term. And the original Hebrew language Old Testament was written in, uh, this word is kind of a loan word in, in Hebrew from Egypt. And it actually just means a chest or a cabinet. And it can also mean a coffin. Isn't that interesting? So basically, when we say ark, we automatically think what? A big boat, right? And truth be told, God told Noah to build a big box. That's why it's an ark and not... Otherwise, you would assume that he would say, hey, build a ship or build a boat. It's like, why is it an ark? It's a, basically a big wooden box. Now, does it have a tip on the front like a ship? I don't know. But it's a word that typically means box. Interestingly enough, if you look at the story of Moses in the beginning of the book of Exodus, you remember that Pharaoh has commanded all of the Egyptian midwives to dump their boy babies in the Nile River, right? And what do they do with, with Moses? Do you remember baby Moses? Put him in a basket. They put him in a little ark. It's the same exact word. In fact, it's only two times that it shows up, um, two uh, uh, senses that it shows up in the Old Testament. There's the Ark of Noah, which spared Noah and all of those who were with him. And then there's the little ark for baby Moses, right? It's essentially some sort of wooden box that ends up being a means of salvation. Again, doesn't mean it wasn't necessarily a ship, but that's an interesting uh, note as to why it's referred to as an ark. And the reason that he is commanded to build an ark is because destruction is coming, right? God's promise he's going to blot out every living thing under the earth. And what's pretty neat here is in God's original commandment, in God's first commandment to Noah in this passage, he says he's going to make an end of all flesh. That's what he says in verse 13. So he says to build an ark. But before he tells Noah how he is going to destroy all living flesh, he just tells him to build an ark, build this massive wooden box that is going to hold everybody, and uh, then he proceeds afterwards to tell him how it's going to come about. So essentially, he begins by making this command to Noah, and there's this sense that we have to think Noah had to believe God and take God at his word. Think about it. God says, I'm going to bring judgment. I'm going to destroy everything on the earth. Make yourself an ark. Make this massive wooden chest, as it were, or a box or whatever, for you to, to float in. But he doesn't even know he's going to be floating yet. He just knows there's destruction, and he's commanded to build this massive thing. And so right from the get-go, we see that God is promising justice and, and judgment upon the ungodly, but he's also offered a means of mercy. So if somebody wants to continue and read verses 17 and 18 in Genesis 6. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, of which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. Do you say 17 and 18? And 18, yes. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. So this is pretty amazing. So now we get a little bit more of the detail. Right? God initially says, I'm going to destroy everything, build an ark. And if, if you're like me, I, if I was Noah, my first question would be like, well, um, I'm going to build this massive wooden contraption. How's that going to save me again? Like, how, how's everybody dying? Like, we don't know yet, right? So then God says he's going to bring a flood, and, and it's emphatic that he is the one that's going to bring this flood. We have a couple questions. For one, okay, now we know that, that everything's going to die by water. Well, does Noah live near water? We really don't know. 
Do we even know if it had ever rained on the earth? Uh, there's some sense where it might not have. We can't say for sure. The scripture says in Genesis 2 that it hadn't rained at that point, but we don't know if it had ever started raining. But we know, So there's a lot of things we aren't, we're not certain of 100%. But there's two clear truths that show up in these verses. The first thing that God says is, look, everything on the earth is going to die. The second thing is, but, but Noah, I'm going to make a covenant with you. And this is the first time the word covenant shows up in the Bible. We'll come back to this later. This is a huge part of the teaching tonight. But for now, we see these two things. There's promised judgment, but there's also promised salvation. So we see in a couple of verses afterwards, it says that Noah was told to take animals and food. We're going to skip around a little bit. And so God commands three things to Noah in Genesis chapter 6 as we begin. Tells him to build an ark, tells him how big it is, tells him the shape and you know all these things, make the rooms, the decks, all these things. And then we see at one point he tells him to bring two of all the animals in. Later we see that there's seven pairs of clean animals. And then we see a third command that was to store up food. As I said, we skipped over a couple of these things. So God's issued at least three commands to Noah. And there's something very significant if somebody wants to read verse 22. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. So God speaks to this guy named Noah, and Noah obeys. If you remember not that long ago, in, in the beginning of Genesis, God had given a command to everybody in the garden, right? Two people. And he says what? In the garden. A little louder. Don't eat the fruit. Don't eat the fruit, right? So in the garden, you have, you don't have to be bashful. Good job. <laughs> in the garden, you have one command, right? And it seems easy enough. It's not like God said, well, you're going to starve, and I'm not going to feed you anything. And you have to sit there hungry. He just says, look, there's only one thing that's off limits. Prove you love me, but don't, just don't eat this one. Trip. Everything else is fine. God issues a command, and what's mankind do? Disobeys. Disobeys. But now we got a different guy, right? Now we got a guy named Noah, and Noah walks with God. And contrary to Adam and Eve, who disobeyed God, God issues these commands to Noah, and Noah actually listens, right? God speaks, and Noah's, uh, Noah obeys. And something that's really cool that we see throughout the passage is that Noah doesn't talk like at all in this text, and Noah's not asking questions, right? He's not like the typical kid that says, "Why." Why? Why? Hey Noah, I'm gonna I'm gonna destroy everything with a flood. Well, God, why would you do that? I don't think it's a good idea, God. I think we should do things differently. No, he says I'm gonna destroy everything with a flood, build an ark, and then Noah's like, what? A, why an ark? Why is it gonna be so big? God, why? why? None of. God issues a command, and Noah simply listens. Gordon Wenham, a biblical scholar, points out that in this text, Noah's obedience is all that matters. Who he was and what he felt were irrelevant. Noah doesn't have an opinion on this. He's just frankly willing to obey God. And so this is pretty awesome. And so Genesis 6, we see this promise that a flood is going to come, that he is going to bring about destruction. And now if you want to look with me and read the first five verses of Genesis 7. And the Lord said to Noah, go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and his mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and his mate, and seven pairs of the birds of the heavens also, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For in seven days I will send rain on the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. So we see a little timeline so far. God begins by speaking to Noah. Noah begins by preparing. God now speaks again now that the ark is finished. And God says basically to Noah, you, you need to get inside the ark. It's time. In seven days, there is a flood that is coming. It's going to rain. This is the first time we see the occurrence of rain. And it's interesting in the Old Testament, almost every time rain shows up, it's an act of God's judgment. Right? This idea of at least this Hebrew term, it shows up as rain is going to flood the earth. 
God rains fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. God rains hailstones upon Egypt. And so this is one of these things where God is promising his judgment. And so we see a number of things in this timeline, and I want to point this out to us uh, this evening. So the first thing that we see in the text is that God tells Noah, I'm going to destroy the earth. Or not destroy everything on the earth, rather. I'm not going to destroy the earth. The earth will survive. It's the only survivor, right? I'm going to destroy every living inhabitant. First thing God says. Then God tells Noah, look, you need to build an ark. And then God promised the flood and then says, look, this is why you need to build the ark. I'm going to issue this flood. I'm going to spare you. We see how Noah obeyed. He built the ark. Now God says, look, in seven days, you're going to feel some raindrops. You need to get in the ark, get prepared. And so then Noah obeys and gets inside, and we see then that only then does it come to rain. But we can't miss verse 5. So I want to read verse 5 again. Tell the all that the Lord commanded him. And look back on chapter 6, verse 22, if you want to read that too. Six twenty-two. Sounds a lot like Noah so did everything just as God commanded him. So this is the testimony of Noah's life. God speaks. Noah obeys. He doesn't ask questions. He doesn't go back and forth. He doesn't tell God, God, I think I could do this a little better than you. All right, God, I think you're a moral monster for all these things. None, none, nothing like that. God speaks, and Noah obeys. And Noah obeys, and we, we can't miss this, even though it totally didn't make any sense. Noah's obedience was completely and 100% an act of faith. Somebody wants to turn to Hebrews chapter 11 and read verse 7. Keep your finger in Genesis, we'll obviously be coming back. Hebrews 11, verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. So Hebrews 11 is the famous hall of fame of faith, essentially, right? And Noah makes it because Noah obeys in faith. God commands Noah with, to build an ark. Now, you can imagine that was quite the endeavor. And if Noah did not have faith in what God said, he wouldn't have listened and he wouldn't have survived. It wasn't like God said one day, hey, Noah, something's coming this afternoon. There's going to be a little bit of water. Could you go hop in your kayak you already have real quick? Um, because you're going to want a flotation device when the rain comes this afternoon. Right. God tells him to build this incredibly massive boat that was about 450 feet long, bigger than a football field. Right. It's, it is a huge honking boat. Right? Like it's, it's ridiculous to even think that somebody could build something that big. And so God tells him, I really wish, one of the questions that I would love to ask God is like, how long did it take? You know, it tells you when the flood came, it tells you how old Noah was, tells you when he had kids and all these things. And I'm like, I don't care how old Noah was when he had kids. How long did it take him to build the boat, right? You know, that's, if I have one question about the time frame with Noah, that's what, I, that's what I wonder. But regardless, Noah obeyed in faith, right? It took a long time, and it took a lot of persistence. I'm sure there was days when Noah was out building with, I don't know what sort of hammers they had thousands of years ago. And you can imagine after maybe a couple weeks or possibly a couple months, can you imagine a little doubt setting in? Like, well, God told me it was going to rain, and he said there was going to be a flood, and he said I should build this big ark. But am I actually sure that it's going to rain? Like, what if, what if God's not telling the truth? Do I really have to do this? You know, if you're like me, you'd start to question after a little while. After you get enough calluses and blisters, you'd probably be saying, I... I don't know about this whole building project thing, God. Like, have you seen the size of this thing? This is pretty hefty. So it takes both time and persistence for him to build it. And again, Noah is building by faith. He's not building it, as far as we know, on the edge of the sea. We're not positive if it had ever rained before. We don't know. But at the end of the day, floods are a pretty big deal, and it probably had never flooded at the least. 
And so God tells Noah to do this, and Noah obeys in faith. There was no weatherman that could confirm it for him. Uh, he couldn't wait for the raindrops to start coming to find inspiration or anything like this. Can I tell you that the raindrops, they didn't motivate Noah. They vindicated him, that he was right all along in believing God. On that day when the raindrops started falling and the judgment of God was coming, all of a sudden Noah realized, I'm not crazy after all. Like this, this faith thing is totally worked out. Hebrews 11 there, it says that Noah was warned by God concerning events as yet unseen. Right? There, there was no sense that this was going to happen apart from simple faith in God's word. And so Noah's faith in God and then his faith active through works ends up sparing him from destruction. Right? He's an incredible example to us of simply obeying what God says to do and trusting God with the rest knowing that God is the sovereign creator of heaven and earth. Can I remind us he knows what is best? He knows the end from the beginning. We have ideas of what we're going to do tomorrow, but how many of us have ever had our plans messed up and been very surprised? That's why I try not to say I will do something anymore. I've really tried to move towards Lord willing, I'll do X, Y, and Z, because I find out my plans, they're very far from permanent. Me and Kevin are going for a run tomorrow morning at 6.30, Lord willing. Is it going to storm and thunderstorm and cancel our plans? I don't know. That's up to God. Is it? You know, there's all sorts of different things. We make our plans, but our plans, they come and go. But when God speaks and God says to Noah, look, it's going to flood sometime in the foreseeable future, you can take this to the bank, Noah. Remember, reminder, this is God speaking. He knows the beginning from the end. You really ought to trust me because I know what I'm talking about. And so for us, too, to remember that we need to simply take God at his word when he speaks in his word to us because God is a faithful God. He will not lie. And he'll bring to pass everything that he has decreed. And so Noah goes and he begins this construction. He obeys and everything. He this consistent remark that Noah obeyed not just some of the things, but everything God commanded. And if somebody wants to go now, we'll read verses uh, 10 through 16 in chapter 7. After seven days, the flood waters came from the earth. In the sixth hundredth year of Noah's life, on the seventeenth day of the second month, on that day all the springs of the deep burst forth, and the floodgates of the heavens were opened. And the rain fell on the earth forty days and forty nights. On that very day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, together with his wife and the wives of his three sons, entered the ark. They had with them every wild animal according to its kind, all livestock according to their kind, every creature that moves along the ground according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, everything with wings. Hairs of all creatures that have the breath of life in them came to Noah and entered the ark. The animals going in where were male and female of every living thing, as God had commanded Noah. Then the Lord shut them in. 17? No, 16 for now. Oh. <clears throat> That's good. So that they have to come up with good breaks. Sometimes they seem kind of arbitrary, but it's, it's helpful to only do a couple verses at a time. So there's this long period of time of waiting, right? Remember, God originally says to Noah, you need to build an ark. There's a flood coming. Period of time goes by. We don't know how long it took Noah. Again, I wish we did. We don't know how long it, it took him to obey God and to build this monstrous ark. But there comes a time when, when God says to Noah, listen, okay, I know I gave you that really big heads up way back when. Uh, but now you guys need to get in the ark because in seven days, it's going to rain. And so we see in Genesis chapter 7, verse 10, that it says, and after seven days, it's almost like God knows what he's talking about. God gives him a warning way down the line. Then God gives him a, a shorter warning, says in seven days. So just as God had said in seven days, this rain ends up coming. And here's something that's really amazing. Some, somebody want to read the beginning of verse 13 again.
On the very same day, Noah, his son, Shem, Ham, and Jephthah, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of the sons with them entered the ark. You catch the very first part of that? Very day. It's almost like it was planned. Mm -hmm. You could catch that on your calendar perfectly. It says in seven days, it's going to rain. And they get in just in time, right? They start up, they obey God. They get all the animals together, all these different things. And just as God said on the seventh day, the rain comes. And it just so happens, and, and God's perfect preservation, that he just waits long enough that they obey on the seventh day. They all get in the ark. And so finally, this, this time of judgment is coming. And then if you want to read again, somebody else read again, verse 16. The very end of verse 16. And the Lord shut them in. That's very important. So we see a balance through this whole life of Noah that he faithfully obeys, right? God issues the warning, all these different things. Noah faithfully obeys. But ultimately, his salvation was in whose hands? The Lord's. Think about that. They're easy, they're easy answer. I try not to give you guys real hard, like, we're not getting into the finer tenets of soteriology or something. It's, we'll get there. God is the one that is ultimately Noah's Savior. Think about this, right? Does Noah obey? Yes. Does he build the ark? Yes. Does he get in the ark? Yes. But last I checked, boats with holes, they don't do so good, right? They'll go down. I would classify a door as a big hole. So you have, you, can you imagine the scene that God speaks to this guy and says, hey, heads up, way down the road, you got to, please, no, just take my word for it. You're going to want an ark for the day this is coming. Start building. And then Noah obeys, right? And he builds this big ark, and they get Noah and his family and all the animals in, and they got this big heavy door they can't move, and the rain comes, and they say, well, this is, I built this thing for nothing. <laughs> right? After, after all of Noah's effort in his faith and his obedience, his salvation was still in God's hands because God is the one that shuts him in. And we miss that so often. If you read half the kids' Bibles, half the kids' Bibles tell you Noah shuts the door. Noah was not the one to shut the door. A door that elephants can walk up, Noah ain't shutting that door, all right? God is the one who brings about the salvation of Noah. And so from the very beginning to the end, right, God forewarns Noah and gives him the opportunity for salvation. And then Noah responds in faith. And then now God secures his salvation by shutting the door. Now, somebody wants to go and read verses 17 through 24. The flood continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth. The ark floated on the face of the waters, and the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering the 15 cubits deep, and all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind. Everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. All right. So the water covers the earth, right? We know this part of the story. And the scripture is abundantly, incredibly, exhaustively clear that salvation is only found in the ark. If you're, when the waters cover everything, if you're in the ark, you're okay. If you're outside of the ark, you're toast. Now, some people don't like the idea of a global flood, and there's some people that try to believe, well, maybe it was more of a localized flood, and maybe Mesopotamia got flooded, but, you know, everybody else was okay. I think that the narrator here is trying to make it incredible, and obviously God and the inspiring of his words. I think he's kind of taken that option off of the table. Have you ever, um, maybe you've talked to me and, and felt this way, I hope not. Have you ever talked to somebody that belabors a point so long and you're just like, I can take a hint? Have you ever been there? One of my, um, 
But you you look at them and you're like, tell me how you really feel. You ever you ever been there? Um, I I don't know if anybody here, I know Kevin is, but anybody else that's a big fan of Dave Ramsey. I love Dave Ramsey's teaching on finances. And sometimes he will go on this massive rant for like an extended period of time. And he'd just go into town on somebody because they asked a really dumb question or whatever, you know. And and he goes on and on and on and on and on and belabors the point. And my favorite part always is if he will sometimes end his rants by saying, I hope I wasn't unclear. <laughs> and every time it makes me laugh because the whole time you're like, really, Dave, tell me, tell me what you really feel about it. I hope I wasn't unclear. <laughs> when I read this little chunk, or when, and when Chris reads it too, when any of y'all read it, <laughs> Do you feel that way just a little bit where you're like, really? Tell me how you really feel. So verse 21, in case people aren't sure that like the flood covered everything, just in case. First of all, it says the flood covered all the earth. Then it says it covers all the mountains, just in case you were wondering. Then it goes on in verse 21, it says all flesh died. In my opinion, if you just simply said all flesh died, what do you think that means? All flesh died. Right? You know, like last time I checked, when you open a dictionary and you look at the word all, means all, right? So he starts and says, All flesh died. In case you were wondering, that includes uh, birds, livestock, beasts, swarming creatures. So it's everything. Just in case you're wondering, here's all the categories. And then he says in verse 22, Everything on the dry land in whose nostril was the breath of life died. So first we have everything that moves died. And by the way, in case you don't know what that is, here's the list of things that moved. They all died. And then not only did the moving things die, but the breathing things died. In case you were wondering, they're the same things, but they're dead too. And then he goes on in verse 23 and says, He blotted out every living thing on the face of the ground. Again, man and animals and creeping things and birds, in case you're wondering the categories. And then one final time at the end of verse 23, he says, they were blotted out from the earth. I hope I wasn't unclear, right? Like, five different ways. And then just in case you still had any doubts, says, after all of those things, he says, and only Noah was left in those on the ark. So everything that moves, everything that breathes, everything that everything's on the earth all dies. And everything that's in the ark survives. In case there's any questions, you know, like I read this today and I was looking at it today, and it's like, I think I could take a hint. I mean, I hope so, right? And so we see that there's this, this plain truth that salvation is only found in the ark. It's the only way to be saved from the judgment of God. So Noah is spared. Noah finds grace. Noah obeys in, in faith. God spares him. And then now we have this little family with this nice portable zoo floating on the, the newfound ocean that's everywhere. Somebody wants to read ver uh, chapter 8. We're going to read verses 1 through 3. Then God remembered Noah and every little, every, every little living thing. And all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the water subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heaven were all stopped. And the rain from the heaven was restrained. And all the waters receded continually from the earth. At the end of the 150 days, the waters decreased. So in Scripture, God's remembrance always entails God's action. And so, and God doesn't remember as if he forgot. It really has more of a sense that he, it comes back to his mind and he's thinking about something, not that he's ever, God's never forgotten anything. Let me reassure you of that. And so God stops here and he sees Noah and he sends this wind, he turns the faucet off, all these different things. And again, I want us to consider once again how thorough the scripture is that God was the savior of Noah and of the human race. He gives Noah this massive heads up. Hey, there's a flood coming. I'm going to give you time to build. And then a shorter heads up. In seven days, a flood is coming. You need to get in the boat because in seven days, it's going to rain. Then God shuts the door and spares them. And 
All this time, can I tell you, Noah's life is still not guaranteed apart from the hand of God. Right? God had told them to pack up their families, to pack up the animals, and to pack up food. Food is not forever. Can you imagine God doesn't bring the wind? And so they float until they all starve to death. Think about it. That would be a horrible way to end this. Like, you're reading along, and if we didn't know the end for all we know, it's like, okay, now everything's covered with water. Well, Noah's not going to exactly start a garden in the boat, and you're going to run out of animals to eat eventually, and you're going to run out of food you had packed. So now, once again, we see so clearly that God is the one who is preserving life. God made the means, and then now God is accomplishing it as he sends this wind to cause the water to deplete. And so then from here, a lot of us are familiar with how Noah sends out the dove, he sends out the raven, these different things. We're going to skip that for the sake of time. If you want to jump down, if somebody wants to read verse 20 through 22. And Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man. For the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Never will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, sea time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. So as I said, we skipped over the, the sending out of the birds and these things, and ultimately the water recedes, the arcs on top of the mountain, all these things, they get off the ark. God has officially and finally saved Noah and the family. And when Noah gets off the boat, right, gets out of the ark, the first thing he does is what? He offers a sacrifice. And a sacrifice is an act of what? Worship. How do we start our service tonight? After prayer of us. And songs are? Ideally, right? That's the, that's the hope. And we gathered and we said what? Amazing grace, right? How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I'm blind, and now I see. And so we start our services coming together and singing praise to God. And we typically will worship God for one of two reasons. One, for who he is. And then for two, for what he's done for us. And so God has now spared Noah's life. And the first thing that Noah does when he gets off is he offers worship to the God who spared his life. Noah realizes how indebted he was to God. If God hadn't forewarned him about the flood, he would have been toast with everybody else. If God wouldn't have shut the door, he'd have been toast with everybody else. And if God wouldn't have caused the water to go away, they would have eventually starved. So now he has finally realized, God has spared my life. Every other human being on the planet outside of the eight that were on the ark was toast. And Noah realizes the incredible grace of God, and he responds with sacrifice. He responds with worship. One of the reasons we believe that there were seven pairs of clean animals on the ark. They weren't all just two by two. There were seven pairs of clean animals. Because you can imagine, you get off the ark with the only two sheep. There's a boy sheep and a girl sheep, and you say, thank you, Lord, for this deliverance. Yeah, you take out the sheep, and then guess what? Shepherds are out of business for the rest of the time because there ain't no more sheep, right? Sheep would have been extinct. So God sends extra clean animals on the front end, and this is what Noah does with them. And then God responds with a blessing on all creation. We'll see this unpacked in verse uh, or in chapter nine. In chapter nine is incredible, and this is what we really want to focus in on uh, this evening. If somebody wants to read verses one through four in chapter nine. Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall. The fear and dread of you will fall upon all beasts of the earth and all the birds in the air, upon every creature that moves along the ground and upon all the fish of the sea. They are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. But you must not eat meat that has not that has its lifeblood still in it. And for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal, 
and from every and from each man too. I, I will demand an accounting for the life of his fellow man. You can finish down through verse seven. So, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall this blood be shed. For in it the image of God has God made man. As for you, be fruitful and increase in number, multiply on the earth and and increase upon it. All right, so in Genesis chapter 9, we see new beginnings. Right? In a sense, it's like creation all over again. In the beginning, God had made everything good, right? And he puts two people in the garden, things start off well. And it's not a, exactly a brand new beginning because we know that the fall still has impacts in the world. But it is a bit of a fresh start. And so with this new fresh start, uh, we see this recommissioning of mankind to populate the earth. We see that now mankind has given uh, animals as food, which was not the case beforehand, just with some stipulations there. But then in verses 5 through 7, we see that there is a, a very separateness between human life and animal life. And I want to remind us of this this evening, that human life is incredibly significant to God because we were made in God's image, right? Donkeys are not made in God's image. Sheep are not made in dogs or, or sheep are not made in dogs image or God's image. Dogs are made in dogs image. I guess is how it works. Can't talk sometimes. We never want to lose sight of the fact again that, that Genesis begins with the goodness of creation and a reminder to us that mankind was created in the image of God. And as such, if if all mankind, even those who have sinned and fallen short, even those who maybe bear an imperfect version of that image of God. All human beings are image bearers, and God cares more about humans than the rest. Why? Because here we see very clearly that mankind is permitted to kill and eat animals. Mankind has never been permitted to kill and eat other people. And everybody said, amen. Right. <laughs> And likewise, we see that if, a, if an animal kills a man, what happens to the animal? For Genesis uh, chapter 9, verse 5. For man, if an animal kills a man, what happens to the animal? The animal dies. The animal dies, right? There's consequences. If an ox goes nuts and kills a man, the ox will be killed in return. That's that's the reckoning that will come. And then likewise, if a human kills another human, there's going to be recompense. And then for the shedding of blood, there's there's going to be more shedding of blood. And so we, we must never forget that, and especially in our dealings with other people, that you and I were image bearers of God. And so mankind is the crown of God's creation. We must never lose sight of this. Now, we should love and take care of animals, absolutely. I don't believe in torturing animals or mistreating them or whatever. We got a little bird that, that sits on a tote in our back porch, and I love it to death. Um, if you've ever looked at our house and you wonder why is there this random gray tote on the on, the rest of the back porch is a mess too, so forgive us. But if you ever wonder why in the world is there this random gray tote on the pastor's picnic table that just never leaves, there's a family of Carolina wrens. They're these little itty bitty birds that love to sing, and I love them to death. They are basically our pets. And they live in there. They live in that tote. It's their home. And so if you come over and we play cornhole, don't move that tote. My pets are in there. <laughs> I love animals. I do, especially the Carolina wren. When I sit on the back porch and read my Bible, when it comes and sings to me, it's, it's awesome. It's like the highlight of my day. I would never wish evil on that, but I must never lose sight that this Carolina Wren is not made in the image of God, even though I think it's really cool, and I love to hear it saying, except when it wakes me up. Um, but that's how it is with everything. A lot of people are, are dog lovers, and you should be. Dogs are great. Some people are cat lovers. I don't know if you should be a cat lover, but we're not going to get into that. Um, that's a different story. But regardless, we should take care of animals. We never lose sight of the fact that mankind is unique. Don't lose sight of the, you. Some people are nicer to their animals than they are to, their, to other people. We should be nice to animals. <laughs> but people, again, are made in the image of God. The idea that animals are just equal to people, they're just as important and everything else, that's a secular worldview. That's not a biblical worldview. We didn't both come from the same space dust. We must always keep that in mind. 
And so we see this, these promises from God, we see this sense of a little bit of a new creation. And then now we're going to read a, a larger chunk. And this is what we really want to hit on here briefly. Somebody wants to read verses 8 through 17. If you want to break it up, read a couple and pass it off. Either way, chapter 9, verse 8 through 17. God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. It is for every beast of the earth I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant, and I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you, for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all the flesh that is on the earth. There's a super significant word that shows up in that passage an awful lot of times. Did anybody catch it? Bo. What's that? Bo. That's one of them. There's Co another one. Covenant. 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 Bo's good too. No. It's a book. Covenant shows up. It helps when you're the reader because you're like, oh, there it is again. There it is again, right? <laughs> And so this is really, really important. God first promised in chapter 6, verse 18, or earlier, I said we'd get to this later, he said that to know whether he would establish his covenant with him. And now we see in chapter 9 the implications of what is called the Noahic covenant. And if you want to remember how to pronounce it, uh, something that's helpful for me is Noahic. It's like there's no way he's going to flood the earth again. No way, no a. Also rhymes with Mosaic covenant. But there's no way He's going to flood the, the earth again. So this is the Noahic Covenant. We have on our board here as we've been looking every week. So you might be like, all right, well, we've been, thought this was big picture. And we're like, we're zoomed in on Noah. What's the big deal? This is the first time that the word covenant shows up in Scripture. In, the Hebrew word is uh, berit, and it's used almost 300 times in the Old Testament. The first time it shows up is in the account of Noah. It's first promised in Genesis 6, and then we see there's seven times, Chris, you read seven different times in, Gen in Genesis chapter 9, this idea of covenant shows up. And a covenant is essentially a contract or agreement between two parties. It's a contractual arrangement, and the Lexham Survey of Theology summarizes co uh, the concept of covenant by this way. It says, the covenants are relationships God establishes with people on the basis of his promises. So God enters into a contract, effectively, with his people. And we'll see more about this later. There's a variety of different covenants. And some people say that there was a covenant with Adam, the Adetic covenant. But this is the first time that it's explicit in the scripture. And so some of the covenants in the Old Testament, they are conditional. Like the Mosaic covenant, God says, if you obey me, you follow my laws, X, Y, and Z, then you will inhabit the land. There's conditions to the covenant. Right? God says, it, under these terms, the covenant will apply. It's an agreement between two parties. But here's the awesome thing about the, the Noahic covenant, is it's an unconditional covenant. God doesn't speak to Noah and to us today and say, on these certain terms, this covenant will apply. God enters into an unconditional, universal, for all time covenant with humankind. And the promise is that he will never flood the earth again. The promise is made to us as humankind. It's made to the creatures and to the earth itself. And this is what call, uh, scholars will call to as a covenant of common grace. It's something that is kind of for everybody. It's not just a special thing just for Israel or anything else. And so the Noahic covenant is incredibly important. And the reason it's important is because it ends up being the foundation upon which the whole rest of redemptive history is built upon. Right? This covenant isn't necessarily redemptive in of itself. God isn't providing salvation um, from sin or spiritual things 
in the Noahic covenant. But God does promise to spare the earth from a flood. And I want us to think about this for a minute. Is there anybody here that if you've ever tried to make something and it doesn't go right the first time you throw it out, is there anybody in that camp? You make pens. Uh, some people are the kind of people that don't like to throw things out, and so they'll try it 1,100 different times before they finally throw something out. But then you have other people that, like, they try it, and the first mistake they make, they pitch it out. Which camp are you in? I throw them out right away. You throw them out right away, okay. They're done. They're done. If you've ever made a, a painting or something, and you will you go and you do one thing, and all of a sudden you're like, it's got a small tick in it or something wrong, or there's color that bleeds, and you're like, it's ruined. You throw it out. You're like, this is junk. I don't care. It's, it's unfixable. There's some people that will try to to polish it a thousand times. I, I know that's not Bill. I, I can care. I know that's one thing. He is the opposite side of the totem pole. You, which is a bit. He said you put like three transmissions or four transmissions in your truck, and uh, it's it's gonna always keep going. Bill's more like more like God with the Noahic covenant. I'm sorry, Sam. <laughs> Some people, the moment something goes wrong, they pick it out, right? You mess up your pen, you're like, I'm done. You mess up a painting, you're done. You mess up whatever it might be, you just throw the whole thing out. You try to get down, some people try to write. And used to write by hand. You sit down and write a poem or something. You write, you know, you crinkle it up, you throw it out. The Noahic Covenant is God saying he's not going to do that with us. And that, for you and for me tonight, is good news. And can I tell you why? Because we all got issues. <laughs> all humans got issues. Every human being has sinned, right? All have fallen short of the glory of God. And if God's plan for Noah's day till now was like, hey, this pen's got an imperfection. <laughs> Time to start over. Can I tell you that creation would have never gotten anywhere? Right? You, we turn the page and there's sin in, in, in humankind. And you turn the page, and there's sin in humankind. And then God calls a guy named Abraham, and he's pretty good. But can I tell you what? Abraham disappoints us. Let me get to a guy named David, and David's a type of Christ, and everybody loves David. If God was in the business of throwing stuff out, we would all be toast. So there's that one moment where God brings his judgment upon creation with the flood. But after the flood, God says, you know what? People are sinful. Instead of scrapping people, I'm going to make a way to save them. That's the good news of Noah's covenant. If he's not going to can everybody and start over, as it were, now he's going to take the, the, the broken pen, the bad painting, whatever. That's what we are. Instead of throwing it out, he's going to redeem it and make a new creation. And so the, the Noahic covenant ends up being the foundation, right? It's the first one written in red here. We have the Abrahamic covenant. Mosaic covenant, Davidic covenant, all these different ways that God works in redemption that are ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. But if God was going to keep restarting when people got incredibly sinful, we would never have redemption. So the, the Noahic covenant, it's like the first brick in the foundation of God's acts in redemptive history, because now we know that God's not going to start over again. <laughs> And so without the stability that's found there, we would never get to those other, other covenants. And then God offers as a proof, the sign of the covenant is the rainbow. And so whenever it rains, which was the method of destruction, right? It was, it was rain that came and flooded. Every time that rain comes, there is a reminder to God, God, you have promised humankind that you're not going to wipe them out with a flood again. You're not going to can them and start over. You're now going to work in redemption. Every time it rains, God is reminded of his promise. Again, not that God is going to forget, but it's there for him, and it's ultimately there for us. And I want to remind us this evening that the rainbow belongs to God's people. Can I tell you that? The rainbow started with God's people. Other people might try to take it and say, the rainbow is our thing. The rainbow is not anybody's but God's. It is a symbol of God's covenant. And it is the most horrible thing to take it and make it the symbol of something that is abominable in God's eyes. It is a symbol of God's covenant. And can I tell you the fact that there is a group of people in the world today that can commandeer God's promise that he's not going to wipe us out anymore to use it for their own sinful purposes 
Can I tell you the fact that God doesn't just wipe them out is a testament to the rainbow that they are using? Think about that. I'm not going to point fingers and say they're worse sinners than everybody. They need Jesus just the same as I did. I am not more, more or less or whatever sinful. We are all sinners, and, and according to James chapter 2, if you are a lawbreaker in one area, you're a lawbreaker, period, you need salvation. I'm not going to say they're farther from Christ than anybody else. They need Christ just the same as, as the good conservative person who doesn't know Jesus Christ. But they did take one of God's symbols and commandeer it for their own purposes. And it is a testament to the incredible mercy of God that God allows them to breathe every day and doesn't extinguish them. And one of the reasons is that Bo is in the cloud. It's an incredible, merciful God that we have. And so we get this assurance. And when we see that, we shouldn't automatically think of the month of June. We should see that and think our God is a gracious God beyond measure, and thank God for that. And if somebody wants to read a little bit more, um, we're going to jump down, read a little bit more, finish Noah's story. I mean, I don't know, a little bit longer than planned, but things we need to repeat in mind. So he wants to read verses 18 through 23 after this covenant is established. The sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These were the three sons of Noah, and from them came the people who were scattered over the earth. Noah, a man of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard. When he drank some of its wine, he became drunk and laid uncovered in his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father's nakedness and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it across their shoulders. Then they walked backwards and covered their father's nakedness. Their faces were turned the other way so they would not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and found out that his youngest son had done to him, he said, how far? You went a little bit too far, but you can just keep going. That's all right. Yeah. If you want to read down through verse 29. Cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves, will he be to his brothers. He also said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan be the slave of Shem. May God extend the territory of Japheth. May Japheth live in the tents of Shem. And may Canaan be his slave. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. Altogether, Noah lived 950 years, and then he died. So God enters into covenant with Noah. Things are going really good. He was spared, and now we have the guy that is chosen to save the human race, drunk and naked. Right? Again, there's this reminder throughout all of Scripture. Yeah. And like, why is it? It's one of those things that's it's crazy. Like, that why? It's, why? 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 <laughs> Weird, like you don't see that they're like, why? Apparently didn't know where the line between a little bit of grapes and a lot of bit of grapes are. I don't <laughs> I don't know. It's one of those things in the Bible that kind of you just think you're such a great guy and also you get drunk and it just does it just puts a little blurb in there and like, Yeah. Oh. Well, I think one of the reasons and I think it's encouraging to us is to remind us that none of God's servants are perfect. Again, like and that Noah gets a pretty bad rap over this, but I mean he's still no he's still no David. Like David's a scoundrel beyond scoundrel city. Yeah. You know? Like if I had to pick a guy to be friends with and be like, listen, he had a little bit too many grapes one time. I'll let that slide. You? David? Oh my word, I got some words for you. But it's one of those reminders, right? That, that all of God's service, I mean, this is the guy. He was just the one that, that God was like, yeah, you're walking with me. You're righteous in this generation. And Noah was the one that was that was used. His sons were righteous. They they benefited off of, off, off of who Noah was. And so the, the narrator doesn't make a huge point on this, but we do see to some extent that there are some imperfections in Noah's life. And then even more so, see, that's not bad enough. Now you got the youngest son comes in and thinks this is great. It's like, guys, go, runs off to his brothers. You would never guess. <laughs> Dad, you know the ark builder? He's hung over and naked. He's knocked out. Go check it out. You know, and it's through his irreverence, probably, right? Ultimately, we know that the fifth commandment will be to honor your father and mother. And it, we assume that's the biggest issue. Some people think that it was how he looked or the fact that he's proclaiming it to others. The other sons, they reverently go and they cover Noah. 
Again, we see that even in this family that God just used to save all of humankind, we got two out of the four guys have got some issues. Obviously, the other two do as well. They just, there's, they're probably thankful theirs didn't get written down in the book, right? And so Noah awakes. Somehow he knows, I don't know how he knows what had been done to him because he was sleeping, but somehow it comes to his knowledge. Genesis chapter 9. And it's in Genesis chapter 9. <laughs> Hey, I, I know you're actually with us. Then. It's not like Revelation chapter 10. He's like, I'm tired of this. I'm going to read something interesting. Let's go get to this graphic stuff. That's good. Thanks for listening. And this is actually the only reported speech of Noah in the entire Bible. Right? God commands Noah. Noah obeys. You know that, that Noah has never said anything at all in the scripture until he wakes up from his naked nap and says, Cursed be Canaan, blessed be the God of Shem. And so this is important, and this will point us forward to next week. Um, Canaan is the one that is cursed. Canaan is going to be the youngest son of Ham. And Canaan, you've probably heard, becomes a nation, right? And Canaan becomes not only a nation, but what? What do you typically think of when you hear Canaan? Anybody? A, what? Okay, that's K not. No, oh, never mind. You're, you're close. I'm close. You're close. Two two letters up. Just No, not quite. It's a. You would go there. <laughs> city. It's a land. Okay, it's not a city, but it's a land. Canaan becomes the promised land. Promised land is the land of Canaan. So we see this promise that comes to Abraham. Again, trying to tie in the big picture here. Shem and Ham and Japheth are these three sons of Noah. Ham, the youngest son, commits this sin, and there's now this curse that is pronounced upon his descendants, the people of Canaan. Canaan is the promised land that is given by God's grace to the descendants of Abraham, who happens to be the descendant of Shem in this passage. And so right from the beginning, we kind of see these two lines. There's the, the line of blessing those who are God's people, ultimately from Shem to Abraham, all the way down through to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you have those that have rejected God, Ham's actions here. Ultimately, the people of Canaan are taken out by Joshua, promised land given to Abraham. So that has its roots right here. This is this thread that's woven throughout the entire Old Testament. In Genesis 10, you see a genealogy of Noah's descendants, and then we will pick up next week with the Tower of Babel. And so as we close from Noah's story, just three thoughts I want to leave you with uh, this evening. For one, Noah found favor or grace in the eyes of the Lord. And the most important question that human beings need to know in the world today, they have an answer for, is how does somebody find grace in the eyes of the Lord? Right? And we know in the New Covenant, there is one way, and his name is Jesus Christ. Noah finds grace. How do we find grace? We find grace through Jesus Christ. And we see in this passage today, the ark effectively functions almost like a type of Christ. Right? If you were in the ark, what was your status? You were saved, right? You were spared from the wrath of God because you were in the ark. And if you were outside of the ark, yeah. Yeah, I like that. You know, and again, we read the passage, right? And it's like everything that moves, everything that breathes, the, the squiggly things, the flying things, the creeping things, the crawling things, breathing, moving, it's all gone. There's no survivors, like totally annihilated, right? And so we have that picture that there's salvation in Jesus Christ. It's like being in the ark. And it's only in Jesus Christ that we can be saved. He is the way the truth, and the life. And we must always remember that salvation is found only in him. There aren't any exceptions as much as sometimes we wish there were. A second thing we really need to take away is that Noah's obedience is rooted uh, in faith. Again, God spoke. That was enough for Noah. Noah obeyed. Noah didn't have an opinion. Noah didn't ask questions. God spoke. Noah listened. 
And so he's such an example for us today as we are God's people who now walk by faith and not by sight. Right? Noah didn't have any assurance other than God's word. He said, God's word is enough for me. I'm going to listen. And we have a very similar experience um, to Noah. I want to read you a passage real quick from 2 Peter chapter 3. And we need to keep this in mind as well. Peter is talking about um, the false prophets who are coming. This will be the last passage, and then we'll close. And he says, they will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do, you know, do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the, day when the, with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with the roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. And so Peter takes the story of Noah as an example for us today. You can imagine that people would have seen Noah building this boat and said, this old man is crazy. Why is he building this boat? We don't know how much of an evangelist he was. There's a sense in the Bible that he's a herald of righteousness. We don't know a whole lot about that. But he looked crazy until it started dripping rain. And Peter says, look, some people are going to say, Jesus has been taking his time. He's not coming back anytime soon. There's not going to be a future day of judgment. You're crazy. Jesus, everything's been going on the way it's always been. And Peter says, no, it's not. There was a day that God stepped in and flooded the world. Some days it goes from being the same for an incredibly long period of time to a, a massive cosmic upheaval. And in the same way, people today might say, oh, well, Jesus, you know, yeah, he was wrong about his second coming. He's not coming back. Or the church has believed for 2,000 years he's going to come back. But that's crazy. I mean, obviously it's not happening. Peter says it exactly in the same way that it wasn't Noah's day and is with us. There's going to be a day when Jesus Christ comes back, and we won't be the ones who look crazy anymore. And so that's an insurance to us. If the world says, oh, you're crazy for believing Jesus could come back, no, his delay has been an act of mercy, allowing people to be saved, and ultimately that day is sure to come. And then last one, final thought, is that, again, God's salvation ought to draw us to worship. Noah's first act after he got off the ark was responding to worship to God's salvation and deliverance. And again, for us, every time we look at a rainbow, we should remember God's covenant and promise to all of humankind that has secured for us uh, life each and every day. Amen. So pray this evening. Father in heaven, I do thank you, uh, Lord, so much for this covenant that you established with Noah that is foundational, that is an everlasting covenant, uh, Lord, that has lasted for thousands of years now, and that God by it, when you see the rainbow, you know that you've promised to us to never flood this earth again, that you are working in redemption and, and not destruction. And Lord, I thank you that you don't throw away the broken. Uh, Lord, that you make the way for us to be saved from our sin through the sacrifice of your son. And we thank you for your gracious and merciful uh, work that you've done for us and just for who you are. And God, I just pray that as we see uh, rainbows throughout our lives, uh, Lord, that we would always think of how gracious you are to us and how much we totally don't deserve it. And God, I pray that Noah's example of faith-filled obedience uh, would challenge us in our own lives to take you at your word and to obey what you say to do. God, I pray you bless those who give them their time to come out this evening for this study. In Jesus' name, amen.